Hi, this is Heather Vox from The Million Person Project. Welcome, thank you for tuning in. The Million Person Project is a global project about love, storytelling, and connecting change makers. And I am so excited to be here today with Shaka Senghor, who is a New York Times bestselling author just recently. Congratulations. Thank you. And I would say also one of the most courageous storytellers that I've seen. Uh-huh. So thank you so much. Thank you for being a part of the conversation around the power of storytelling. So I'd love for you to just introduce yourself to the viewers. Hey, how's it going? I'm super excited to be a part of the Million Person Project and hope that I have some helpful tips that'll be meaningful to you. Let's do it. Yeah, let's um. do it. So really, you've told your personal story in really massive ways. Yeah. One is through your book. Thank you. Which went to the New York Times bestseller list like... Yeah, it's great, Phil. <laughs> and the um. other is your, your TED Talk that has gone completely viral and mm. it's why your worst deeds don't define you right yeah and so if people want to hear shaka's story about being in prison for over two decades and you know you can read his book watch his ted talk what today is about is i really want to understand what did it take for you to share your story and why did you do it well, it took a, um, a lot of thought, um, this is very personal narrative rooted in some of my most vulnerable uh, and shameful moments. But the thing that inspired me to do it was thinking about other young men and women who were growing up in similar circumstances. Uh, you know, the way I grew up in a household with abuse and, and you know, some, some very unfortunate things that transpired. And I wanted to be able to create a platform to make it easier for young people to tell their stories and to share their narratives in a way that would empower them. Mm-hmm. And why do you think it's important for people to share their narratives? Like, why is that a thing? I mean, because your personal narrative is your personal empowerment. And a lot of times we live our lives based on narratives that were handed down to us arbitrarily. And once you begin to understand who you are at the core of your being and you begin to take ownership, of that story is such an empowering experience because you are able to really tap into your authentic self. And what, like, what was your process? How do you, how were you able to tap into that part of your being? It's interesting because I'm, I'm, I'm growing up. I was very shy. Don't like being the center of attention. Uh, and like most people, I was terribly afraid of speaking publicly. But I was driven by, you know, the, the, the realities of what I wanted to accomplish, what I wanted the outcomes to be. And that trumped the fear that I had. And so I just kind of learned in a very organic way, just through talking and conversations and realizing that some of the things that I was sharing with people was really helping them. So. And what does it feel like for you? Like, what, what do you get from sharing your story? It's a very reciprocal experience. Uh, A lot of times people assume that the person who's the speaker is the only one that's, you know, that that he's giving something to the audience. Mm -hmm. But for me, an experience that I've had, I get just as much as I give. And it's that exchange of human energy that's so important for our emotional health and well-being. And if you're a skilled storyteller, you realize that it's not so much about you uh, just throwing and tossing words out to people. It's about really connecting energy around shared uh, values and shared you know, desires for outcomes. So it's a very reciprocal uh, experience. And when was the very first time that you started sharing your story? Um, well, I, I was in prison. I would write short pieces about what I was experiencing in my day-to-day life, uh, which was initially I didn't even think of it as storytelling I thought of it like here's what's happening in my world and I hope you pay attention to it so that we can stop it from happening and then that kind of grew into you know bigger bigger things when it came like writing full books and full stories and when I got released I was invited to speak at a college campus uh, in Wisconsin and that experience really made me 
step back and understand like how important and how powerful storytelling is mm-hmm. when it comes to healing. And w- so wait, so you're you're in jail for over mm-hmm. twenty years. What? Well, you almost twenty years. Almost twenty years. Mm-hmm. You get out of jail and then you get invited to speak on a college campus. Yes. How did that how did that happen? And then when when you got to the college campus and you were sharing your story, why was it part of your healing? Or Well, I, I got invited to speak as a result of my writing. So a professor at uh Platteville, Wisconsin, University of Platteville, Wisconsin had began to take an interest in my writing while I was incarcerated. And once I got released, uh, the Black Student Union was putting together an event that they host every year called Ebony Weekend. And she reached out to them and, and, and kind of offered me up as a person who may be interested in speaking. And so they invited me out. Um, and I had an amazing weekend, like really, really working with young people who were kind of navigating their way through college and trying to figure it out. And it's just something something really powerful about that, you know, that... that um, helped me with some of my own process of being accepted back into society, uh, being connected to people, you know, mm-hmm. just from everyday life. And so that was part of that emotional healing and, and being able to connect me to the broader community. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the part that's so interesting to me because so many of our clients that we work with, mm-hmm. they're navigating the question of, I've spent my whole life trying to not be defined by this story. Yeah. Why would I say it? Like, what what comes of it if I share this story? If I don't want to be defined by, by the abuse, by the crime I committed, by how I hurt someone, by how someone hurt me, if I don't want to be defined by that, then why is sharing my story about that? Why would I do that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, you know, we live in a society where we're used to casting labels on people. And so it's hard to, to you know, uh, get around those labels. But one of the things about telling your story is once you begin to tell it, you take ownership of it and you have possession of it. And so you can allow your story to become, you know, um, whatever you want it to be in terms of your life, whether you want it to be the thing by which you're de- defined or the label or your brand. Uh, but you also can use it as just a skillful tool to uh, help other people in whatever space you're working in. If it's business, if it's you know social entrepreneurship, if it's mentoring, there's a component of personal storytelling that helps people kind of work and navigate their way through those environments. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we look at other people's situations and we're like, oh, I could never do that. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like I would break mm-hmm. if I was in jail for almost 20 years and in solitary confinement for seven. That's my perception is I would break. Yeah. But then when I come into something in my own life, somehow there's a resilience that lives mm-hmm. inside of us that we can ac- access no matter what our situation is. Yeah. What helps you to tap into that resilience? How did you yeah. come out without your spirit broken after spending seven years in solitary confinement? Being introspective and and being able to write and journal and and ex, you know express my emotions through the written word uh, was very effective means by which to keep me focused and centered. Uh, reading the stories of other people, you know, again we're talking about storytelling and how powerful it can be. Whenever I found myself in a vulnerable space, I would just go pick up a book off my shelf and and I didn't have like a real shelf, but. Uh, my little, my little area where I kept my books and I would just open it up to random pages and just read. And being able to see how other people had survived tough circumstances, not necessarily what I was going through, but very tough circumstances. Like I don't think that you get through life without facing something mm-hmm. that's going to challenge you to either shrink or grow. Um, and so it was through literature that I was able to find my true voice and find my authentic self once I found that, you know, I knew that I had to protect it. You know, I knew I had to protect that authentic self from the impact of the environment I was in. And stubbornness is also a great part of it. It's something that we don't talk about, but stubbornness is a very important part of resilience. Like to not give up, to be so stubborn um, that you keep fighting instead of just giving in and caving in. And so that's how I kind of saw the whole thing. Mm-hmm. I love that idea that st- 
stubbornness is like a yeah. useful a useful part of resilience yeah. i feel that yeah and when what is your if i can ask if i can be nosy sure. like what is your faith like do you have a religion are you spiritual what's your practice yeah i'm not i'm not religious at all i um uh, i'm a very spiritual person uh and and my spirituality is accumulation of, of various schools of thought. I think that, you know, we limit ourselves and we kind of box ourselves into to one particular thing. And I wanted to have access. I wanted to have access to wisdom that connected to me in a real way. And, and because of that, um, I was always open to learning more and reading more and, and analyzing more, but also to, to recognize what felt good instinctively to me. And what is it that you that you believe in? I believe that we are all connected by this amazing, amazing universal energy. And that wisdom, to me, like earned wisdom, wisdom that you kind of went through some things and you had to figure out what do I need to get to that next level. Like to me, that's the greatest scripture because it has all the essential elements for our survival encoded in its DNA. But you have to be willing to look at it. So that's kind of how I see, you know, my spiritual growth. There's a lot of people out there that are looking for a way to connect to that universal energy. Yeah. Like they want to believe that they're okay. We yeah. all want to believe that we're okay. And we're looking for something to connect to, to mm. ensure us that, that it's all not just meaningless. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think it's, it's the age-old question, you know, who am I? Why, those age-old questions, mm -hmm. why am I here? What does my existence mean? And, and I think it's, it's a great way to explore life and you'll learn, um, you know, when you're consciously doing it, when you're consciously asking those questions, it, it helps you become really, really present. It helps you really be in a moment, and it helps you connect to people in, in the heart space uh, that, that really matters, so. So the question that comes to me, though, is when you are somewhere like mm -hmm. solitary confinement, mm -hmm. are, were you able to still connect to that universal energy and to, fi to find and feel peace? I mean, yeah, because it's, it's, it starts inside, you know, that's the, that's the connective part, it's, it's really inside, and so I practice meditation, uh, I journal, you know, um, I communicated with other men on the cell block by talking under the door or through the light socket, um, and, you know, you realize that this energy, even when you're alone, that is connecting to other people who is operating in that same space. Mm -hmm. And it's just really more about alignment, like alignment with what you really desire, you know, what, you, what, you, what life outcomes you want. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's about being present as well, like being fully in a moment and realizing that you're a, a thought evolved being. Uh, it's like there's nothing more spiritually grounded than that for me. Mm. So I recently watched you speak in front of like over a thousand people in a completely mm. packed theater. Mm. And I was in the front row and I was watching you and mm -hmm. I was trying to see like, what is it like for him to tell his story? Is he nervous? Mm -hmm. Is he, is he saying things he always says the same way or is he present to this moment and mm -hmm. what, how is he doing that? Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could speak to people who are, are constantly sharing their stories over and over again, watching you, you look, like you're in the moment, like, like you're actually thinking about what you're going to say and then saying it. It's not like you're just ping-ponging back questions. So mm -hmm. what is that about for you? Really, it's, it's more about, it's not even really thinking about what I'm going to say because before, before I do any type of talk, I always, you know, do a prayer um, in honor of those who came before us, who paved the way. And just to that divine energy, and, and you know, I meditate and, and just ask for permission for the right words to, to be shared. Uh, and I think of it as a sharing, shared experience, even though I may be the vessel, it's a shared experience. 
And so some of what you see is not necessarily uh, thinking, but it's just allowing the energy to flow through me. And, and when you're present, no talk will be the same. You know, no, no speech that you give will be the same. The subject matter may be the same, but the rhythm and the nuances, uh, all those things are, are unique to the experience you're having right there in that moment. Because as, as I'm talking, you know, you're connecting with people. And you can see physically that there is some connectivity there. And, you know, you kind of speak to that connectedness, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I, I do it. Hmm. And when things go amazingly in your life, mm -hmm. so for example, when you sign on to Instagram and Oprah has tweeted <laughs> from her <laughs> private jet, she's sure. holding like six copies of your book and saying right. like, if you're going to read one book this month, read this one. Mm -hmm. When things like that happen, are you able to stay, use the same tools to stay as present to the whatever, to whatever's yeah, to opening it up for you? <laughs> Yeah, um, I think you have to stay stay very present in, in order to appreciate what you're experiencing in real time. Um, you know, when that when that happened with the tweeting of of my book from Oprah, like you know, that's a that's one of those moments for an author that will never go away. I mean, because she's the holy grail when it comes to interviews around literature. And, and I mean, any interview she does, she's the Holy Grail, but specifically this. Um, so in that instant, I just really absorbed that energy. It's like, wow, this is really happening. Like the book is really landing in spaces that, you know, going to have long lasting impacts. And that was one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining this conversation. And mm -hmm. in closing, I'd love to ask you, what do you believe is the first step to empathy, to mm -hmm. practicing empathy? So for the people that are out there that watch your TED talk and, mm -hmm. and think, yeah, but that guy murdered someone mm -hmm. or whatever they, and they can't quite connect. Mm -hmm. What, because there are so many people going through that on different levels to different populations of people, what is the first step that we can take to create empathy within us so that we can feel what it feels like to accept another person for who they are? I think, I think that you have to um, look at it from a holistic way, holistic perspective, which we don't always do. We kind of, sometimes we look at these isolated pieces and judge the totality of something on the most insignificant, well not insignificant, but the smallest person, portion of a person's life experience even though it may have had a very deep and um, big uh, impact and so once you start looking at things holistically you start looking at other human beings holistically and you'll start recognizing that in them is the same child that's in you and so if you can if you can see the child in every person you encounter um, it's, it's just such an empowering experience and it really turns things you know around for the better yeah. And it really frees you. Definitely. It's very liberating. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the the thing that's most important to me to recognize is that mm. empathy is not for another person. Right. It's for the peace and recognition of our own humanity that we can feel inside ourselves. Yeah. And I mean, you know, when you, when you think of empathy, it's really about putting yourself in somebody's shoes in a, in a holistic way. So imagining what their life is like in all aspects, you know. Um, and it takes a lot of work. You know, it takes a lot of work to train you up to be able to do it effectively um, whenever you need it. But it's, it's worth it. Well, thank you so much for joining this conversation. And thank you for being you. Mm -hmm. And thank you for being, for modeling to me. Yeah. Like okay. what it looks like to be fully authentic in the moment also for our viewers and for all of us, what mm. it means to be a man who is willing to express his emotions and mm. the, his deeper sense of self. It's a really big gift. It's been a gift to me, mm. so thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, and I'd love for you to leave our viewers with, what are you up to? How can they mm. follow you? So I'm, I'm super excited to share with you 
My New York Times bestseller, Writing My Wrong, that's writing with a W. Uh, you can follow me on all social media at Shaka Singor. That's S-H-A-K-A-S-E-N-G-H-O-R. Check me out. Peace, y'all. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And we'll see you tomorrow, viewers. Thank <laughs> you.